Hello, and welcome to the webcast entitled WWE Fourth Quarter Earnings. I will now turn the call over to Michael Weiss, Senior Vice President of Financial Planning and Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Michael. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to WWE's fourth quarter at full year 2019 earnings conference call. Leading today's discussion are Vince McMahon, our chairman and CEO, as well as Frank Riddick, our interim chief financial officer. Their remarks will be followed by a Q&A session. We issued our 2019 earnings and 2020 business, out, business outlook release earlier this morning and have posted the release our earnings presentation, other supporting materials on our website, corporate.wwe.com forward slash investors. Today's discussion will include forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements reflect our current views, are based on various assumptions, and are subject to risks and uncertainties disclosed in our SEC filings. Actual results may differ materially, and undue reliance should not be placed on them. Additionally, the matters we will be discussing today may include non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliation of non-GAAP to GAAP information is set forth in our earnings release and presentation, which as I mentioned, are available on our website. Finally, as a reminder, today's conference call is being recorded and the replay will be available on our website later today. At this time, it's my privilege to turn the call over to Dave. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As you know, for the year, um, we achieved record revenue and profit, which reflected our new distribution agreements with Raw and SmackDown. However, our performance was at the low end of recent guidance as we worked through our Middle East distribution agreement and our ongoing efforts to strengthen our brand and customer engagement. Fox and USA uh, Network provide powerful platforms for broadening our audience, driving growth, our engagement metrics, including our television ratings, as well as live event attendance showed growth during the quarter, with SmackDown TV ratings increasing 20%. Live, events, live event attendance was up 15%. As you know, the board and I recently announced the management transition. This decision did not reflect a change in our strategy. It was made after careful consideration to remain highly focused on growing the value of our content, furthering international expansion, engaging fans, across all platforms. The decision, of course, of management transition was based on a different view of execution of our areas of, of focus. Over the 10 years, supported by a strong management team, George Berrios and Michel, made more than significant, made more than significant uh, contributions to WV. However, with the exchange, we won't miss a beat. We have a deep team of talented executives committed to our company, who are more than capable of executing our strategy. The fundamental sources of our long-term growth, including the ability to capitalize on the rising value of live sports content, remains unchanged and strong. While we are providing perspective today in our business outlook for 2020, you should note that we are pursuing initiatives that could substantially enhance our performance. These include the distribution of content in the Middle East and India, as well as the evaluation and execution of strategic alternatives for our direct consumer service, which could be implemented, quite frankly, in the next uh, quarter. We're currently changing the WB culture to be more collaborative, more inclusive, developing initiatives to reimagine our company and content, bringing in new ideas and enhancing our executive team by recruiting our global talent, we, explain, we uh, remain extremely optimistic about our future and our long-term growth potential. Quite frankly, I have more confidence than ever that we're going to exploit uh, all of our opportunities. So I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Frank Riddick, who's our interim CFO and long-standing member of the Board of Directors. Frank. Thank you, Vince. There are several key topics which we'd like to review today. These include discussion of our financial performance, the progress of key strategic initiatives, and our business outlook. In 2019, we generated record revenue of $960 million, reflecting significant growth from the start of our new content agreements in the United States, which became effective in the fourth quarter. Our adjusted OIBDA was $180 million, 
as the growth in rights fees and lower incentive compensation were offset by weaker performance across other product lines and the impact of accelerated investment to support our core content creation. Given both the changes in the media industry, increased disruption from new direct consumer services and heightened competition for viewers, as well as the challenges to our brand engagement, we believe that increasing our ability to create compelling content represented a prudent course of action. This was not a decision that was made easily, but ultimately the right thing to do. As we transition SmackDown to Friday nights on Fox broadcast, our engagement metrics, including TV ratings and live event attendance, showed marked improvement. Domestic TV ratings for SmackDown, which declined 15% in the first quarter of 2019, improved to a 20% increase in the fourth quarter, with a 25% increase in December. Similarly, domestic TV ratings for Raw, which declined 14% in the first quarter of 2019, saw a 5% increase in December. In the quarter, Raw outperformed the aggregate ratings performance of the top 25 cable networks. SmackDown was the number one rated Friday night broadcast program among the coveted 18 to 49 demo and outperformed the aggregate ratings of the top four broadcast networks. Also indicative of strengthening engagement, average attendance at our live events in North America, which declined 12% in the first quarter, improved to an increase of 15% for the fourth quarter. Early indications in January show continued positive trends. During the fourth quarter, strong revenue growth from our new U.S. distribution agreements was partially offset by the timing of original series, absent of a large-scale event, as well as lower subscription to WWE Network. Importantly, the ongoing investment to support the creation of our content was balanced by a reduction in accrued management compensation associated with our full-year performance. To review our business performance in the quarter, let's turn to page five of our presentation which shows the revenue, operating income, and adjusted OIB to contribution by segment as compared to the prior year. Looking at our media segment, adjusted OIB to increase 62%, or $44.5 million, driven by the escalation of domestic right fees for our Raw and SmackDown programs. Revenue growth was partially offset by the absence of Mixed Match Challenge, an original series licensed to Facebook last year, a reduction in network subscription, and increased content-related expenses. WWE Network's average paid subscribers decreased 10% to approximately 1.42 million for the fourth quarter, driven primarily by the impact of lower subscriber additions earlier in the year. We have projected that the network's average paid subscribers will increase on a sequential basis to approximately 1.47 million for the first quarter of 2020. Given the evolution of new streaming services and the increasing value of live content, we believe there may be alternative strategic options for the WWE Network, which would enable us to further monetize our most valuable premium content. Thus, we're currently evaluating alternative strategic options. During the quarter, we made important progress on other strategic initiatives that extended the reach of WWE brands. Specifically, we completed a free-to-air distribution agreement with Viacom CBS's Channel 5 in the UK and extended our agreement with Supersport in Africa which will create a dedicated WWE channel. We also premiered the second season of Ms. and Mrs. on USA Network and announced the fifth season of Total, Bella, Total Bellas uh, to air on E! beginning on April 9. Turning to our live event business, as shown on page 7 of our presentation, adjusted OIBDA from our live events declined $3.8 million, primarily due to the absence of Super Showdown, a large-scale event that we held in Australia in the fourth quarter of 2018. Although we had 14 fewer North American events in the quarter, this change had limited impact on adjusted OIBDA. Despite the absence of Super Showdown, we continued to success successfully stage large-scale events for our fans. We held our second such event in Saudi Arabia, and shortly thereafter announced an expansion of our partnership to hold a second event in that country every year through 2027. Domestically, we staged Survivor Series, which anchored an extended weekend that attracted nearly 40,000 fans over the four-day period to the Allstate Arena in Chicago. In our consumer product segment, adjusted OIBDA increased slightly from the prior year quarter as a reduction in video game royalties was offset by lower operating expenses. During the quarter, we continued to drive growth from the distribution of mobile games, increasing installs to nearly $125 million across our game portfolio led by WWE champions. 
Page nine of our presentation shows selected elements of our capital structure. As of December 31st, 2019, WWE held approximately $250 million in cash and short-term investments. Additionally, we estimate that WWE has approximately $200 million in debt capacity under our revolving credit facility. In 2019, we generated approximately $53 million in free cash flow as compared to $154 million in the prior year. The decline was due to unfavorable changes in working capital related to our fourth quarter event in Saudi Arabia and the payment of prior year's accrued management incentive compensation. Additionally, the change in free cash flow also reflected a $37 million increase in capital expenditures, the majority of which was related to the execution of our workspace plan. Notably, we returned more than $120 million of capital to shareholders in 2019, consisting of approximately $83 million in share repurchases and $37 million in dividends paid. This include, included nearly $75 million of stock repurchased in the fourth quarter, representing approximately 15% of the authorization under our $500 million repurchase program. Looking ahead over the next few years, we believe that WWE is well positioned to take advantage of significant growth opportunities. These include the rising value of live sport content, the growth of media and entertainment in international markets, and the evolution of other businesses, specifically WWE Network. In 2020, the escalation of rights fees provides contractual revenue growth of approximately $185 million. We expect that this growth will be partially offset by an increase in operating expenses from multiple sources. Higher costs to develop new sources of revenue, the full year impact of 2019 content-related investments, the reset of performance-based management incentive compensation, and the annual rise of staff costs. You should note that while we anticipate incremental investment over the long term to support our growth initiatives, we are working to moderate that investment in 2020. We're also pursuing several strategic initiatives that, increase the mon that could increase the monetization of our content in 2020 and subsequent years. These include distribution of content in the Middle East and India, and the evaluation of strategic alternatives for a direct-to-consumer service WWE network. At this time, the outcome of these initiatives is subject to considerable uncertainty. Excluding the potential impact of these initiatives, we anticipate 2020 adjusted OIBDA of 250 to 300 million. Management believes it has the potential to exceed this range, but we're unable to provide additional guidance at this time. Previously, we discussed a step up in capital expenditures in conjunction with our workspace strategy. For 2020, we estimate total capital expenditures of 180 to 220 million, which includes, includes approximately 130 to 160 million to build out our new headquarters facility. For 2021, we estimate total capital expenditures of 120 to 140 million, including approximately 80 to 100 million to complete construction. We expect total capital expenditures to return to approximately 5% of revenue by 2022, which is in line with a historic range of approximately 4 to 7% of revenue and is predominantly related to maintaining existing infrastructure. For the first quarter of 2020, we estimate adjusted OIBDA of 60 to 65 million, which represents approximately five times the adjusted OIBDA results achieved in the prior year quarter. The estimate reflects substantial revenue growth from our new content distribution agreements in the U.S., which became effective in the fourth quarter, and the February staging of the large-scale event in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. We also anticipate that first quarter growth will be partially offset by an increase in operating expenses associated with developing new sources of revenue and reflecting the full year impact of 2019 investments. The former includes higher costs to accommodate the production of SmackDown broadcast live on Friday nights, four rather than one day following Raw, and to produce an additional hour of NXT on Wednesday nights. The fundamental elements of our growth strategy remain unchanged. As mentioned earlier, we believe we are well positioned to take advantage of the rising value of live sports content, as well as strong media and entertainment growth in international markets. Additionally, we have confidence that we can grow our sponsorship business and leverage increasing digitization to expand and engage our audience. With the escalation of content, content rights fees, we've seen an increasing share of revenue coming from contractual arrangements, and we expect that trend to continue, further transforming our business model. We're in the process of evaluating, evaluating several strategic initiatives that could materially impact our growth trajectory. And we are targeting a date by the end of the first quarter to communicate our long-term strategy. 
We're committed to providing a comprehensive perspective on our roadmap for creating shareholder value. And we look forward to meeting with you, our investors, and analysts. That concludes this portion of our call, and I'll now turn it back to Michael. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Nicole, we're ready uh, for questions. Please open the lines. Thank you, sir. We will take our first question from Ben Swinburne with Morgan Stanley. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thanks for all the call. Two questions for you. First, I just want to confirm your guidance for 2020 assumes, at least if I'm hearing you right, zero revenues associated with your rights, uh, TV rights or media rights in India and the Middle East. Uh, I just want to see if that's correct. And, and if it is, uh, I understand why you'd have to guide that way, but, but that seems highly unlikely since presumably there is a, a path to some distribution deal. Um, so I just wanted to see if you could add some color there so we can better understand the guidance, and then I have a follow-up. Well, on, on media, you're correct. On India, it would be the increment from the new deal because we have an existing deal in India that's in place. Um, and what we're, what we're, we have, have taken that out because of the uncertainty, not about whether we feel pretty confident that, the, that these new agreements will be put in place. And as I said, we have an yeah. existing agreement in India already. The uncertainty is around the timing of that and the ultimate value that we receive. I see. And you're, you are still on the air in India as of right now, right, in this first quarter, correct? correct? Yes, sir. That's okay. Correct. Got it. Okay, great. And then secondly, on the strategic review for the network, what are you guys trying to achieve there? I mean, is this a business you think you can sell, um, or are you looking to maybe turn this into a license stream like your broader media business, sort of de-risk it with a partner like an ESPN Plus or something like that? I don't know if there's any more color you could add. I, I realize it's, it's sort of an ongoing review, but just what, would love to hear anything else you could share. Well, we have a lot of options. Uh, we can continue on as we are now uh, with an enhancement of a, a free tier and, and a uh, more enhanced paid tier, but we have that as an option. We also have an option. I mean, right now, there's no more better time to exercise you know, the selling of our rights you know, to all the majors, and quite frankly, all the majors are really clamoring for our content. Uh, so that could be a significant increase, obviously, in, in terms of revenue. Got it. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from David Karnofsky with J.P. Morgan. All right. Thanks for taking the question. I guess just to follow up on that point to the students, um, when you think about what's on the network now, would anything kind of be off limits, um, you know, with some of your more premier uh, pay-per-views such as WrestleMania, Royal Rumble, would, you know, are, are, am I hearing you right when you say that there's interest from third or linear parties for that content and you'd be willing to kind of uh, move that over or off the network? Um. I think there, there's nothing, you know, obviously the devil is in the details in any of these arrangements, but, um, you know, at this point there's nothing that would, looks like it would be anything that would stop us from, from doing a different type of transaction with the network if we chose to. Okay. And, and you know, I asked this question because we've gotten it, you know, a bunch of times uh, since last uh, week from investors, but can you just say here definitively whether WWE plans to invest with, partner with, or you know, even merge with the XFL at any point in the future? No, the XFL is a separate entity completely. You know, there are about 400 uh, employees. The kickoff, of course, is uh, this coming Saturday. Yeah, it's, it's completely separate. Got it. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Laura Martin from Needham. Hey, hey, Vince, I have a sort of philosophical question. Like one of the things we did with Next is we pulled that proprietary content off the network and put it on USA for cash flow today, which de-risks it, but it also took away programming and your U.S. sub fell. Um, in answer to Ben's question just now, you said that there's people clamoring for rights and that that might be a more valuable way to monetize the network. How do you think about the fact that you can take more cash, but it's coming from the linear TV ecosystem, which is dying in this country, compared to OTT, which is structurally growing, but doesn't give you the near-term cash flow that maybe you could get in a different alternative? Well, Laura, as you know, there's so many uh, majors going into uh, OTT. That's what I was referring to. Uh, it's our network, obviously, are, is our most premium content, and we have like a million and a half subscribers. We've had more, uh, but nonetheless, uh, 
it's another way for us to capitalize uh, on our network. And, and again, as I said, there's very strong interest in all of the majors as it relates to OTT. And you've talked about adding ads in the in the past, like sponsorships or advertising was something we talked about early when you were doing OTT. Have you rethought adding a second revenue stream to the OTT service? That's a possibility. We can leave that open. But again, right now, I mean, if we continue on as the network uh, pretty much as is, then we're definitely going to consider that. If, in fact, we're looking to enhance revenue, um, that would be up to our partners. I see. That makes sense. Okay, great. And then um, I think one of the questions we get most frequently is, what's taking so long? for the MENA and um, India, because we thought those were going to be done like early in 19. And is there, do we have a, will we be done by the end, will we be done with those deals by the end of the first quarter when you're going to give us this comprehensive overview of WWE, do you think? Laura, um, really to, to answer the first part of your question, you know, what's taking so long in India, there's been some regulatory changes that have complicated the negotiations and, um, so, so that that is really the primary reason for the delay there. The MENA rights, um, it's just you know the intricacies of dealing with the Saudi Arabian government and their own uh, ways of going about and doing business. Um, um, I think we, we don't want to predict a specific date, but as I said before, our, our, the uncertainty is around the timing and the amount, not that these deals will eventually be done. Thank you. Let me just add that uh, in making reference to OTT and the interest of all the major players, um, we'd be announcing that deal if we go that way uh, in the first quarter. That's how far along we are. Okay, we'll Thank take you. our next question from Curry Baker with Guggenheim Securities. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, on the buyback, it looks like you guys were, were in the market more active in, in the fourth quarter. You know, I'd have to assume if you thought the stock was attractive, then you'd have to think it's significantly undervalued here. Um, will you be more aggressive um, in the market at these levels under your current authorization? And I, I guess, you know, following on on that, will you consider using or, or leveraging the balance sheet to uh, take take advantage of near term dislocation? Well. Answering the first, the last part of your question, I think you know the capital structure strategy isn't going to change a lot. I don't. I, I think we believe having a flexible capital structure that allows us to have the resources to pursue growth opportunities is probably more important even in the short term. And we do have a lot of liquidity right now, um, so I, I don't think that we would leverage up in a significant way to buy stock on the existing program. Um, you know, the existing program has about $415 million or so of remaining uh, authorization, and we're going to continue um, to run that program the way we have, trying to buy a, a significant discount to what we feel is intrinsic value, you know, constrained only by the regulatory and other, other uh, you know, regulations that we have to, uh, disclosure and regulations we have to follow in the buyback. So um, clearly right now with the stock trading where it is, it's, you know, more attractive than it was. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. And then maybe just one more on um, investments and the and bu and buckets of investments um, you're looking at. You know, this year and over the next couple of years. You know, I think in the past management's um, focused on three main areas. You know, building out your data and tech technology capabilities, localization, which I, I think includes performance centers internationally, as well as, you know, continuing to, um, you know, pay the talent more, et cetera. Um, any more color on, on, you know, how you're thinking about each of these, as well as if there's, you know, maybe other, you know, investment opportunities that um, are also um, that you're considering? I think the only other area that we've that has been um, looked at would be around enhancements to the network, and of course that that is you know somewhat dependent on where we end up on the strategic alternatives. Um, so the other areas continue to be the, the primary focus for investment because that's where the growth opportunities are international. Um, you know, increasing back of the brand value and engagement with with customers, so that setting up for continued rights renewals and, and new products or new services or, or new content that we can put in the market. Is there any way you can put kind of an aggregate framework around, you know, the level of investment spending you're expecting for 2020, like a range or anything? Well, I think what we said 
is that you know we're looking to you know we're going to have the effect of the, the follow-on from the 219 investments in the full year, but we're taking a hard look in 2020 at all the investments um, uh, and uh, to see it, to see to try to find the right balance between investing in the business for future growth and shareholder value and maintaining uh, financial performance at, a, at an acceptable level. So. Um, I, I think we, we did say that 2021 would see more investment than 2020, and we are taking a, a hard look right now at all the investments. But the areas, it will not change. Okay, thanks, guys. Our next question comes from Brandon Ross with Lightshed Partners. Hi, guys. Good morning. Thanks for uh, taking the questions. I, I think first, um, Vince, content is obviously – the lifeblood of this company and the quality of your content is very strongly correlated with the success of your various business units. What, what have you done specifically um, over the last several quarters to improve um, uh, upon the content um, and engagement? And then related, how much input do um, Heyman and Pritchard have on Raw and SmackDown and, and do you believe you need to spend much more on talent to, um, to help stimulate engagement trends? Um, a couple of things on that. We, we think that uh, what we've done thus far in terms of tele television ratings, in terms of higher production value, uh, better storylines, allocation of, a, of our top talent at the same time, bringing on new talent uh, is paramount. Uh, you can just see, again, with the ratings, uh, the current ratings, notwithstanding what's going to happen in the first quarter, um, you can see there's growth there. Uh, and, again, it's sort of like uh, the investment. At one time, we had a lot of talent that was injured. Uh, it, we don't have that right now. Uh, and, again, it's a, uh, it just takes a while to be able to put uh, everyone in the right place, right storylines, right talent. Um, and going into WrestleMania, uh, we think we – have exactly what we want uh, and going forward as well. Got it. And then maybe um, I actually have two more. One's a clarification. So for India, did, did you actually zero out India in the guidance or are you um, attributing the, the, pre, the rate of the prior deal um, uh, in the guidance? I, I wasn't sure about that. No, we, we left the current deal in the guidance, it would be the increment that we were expecting that we took out. Okay. And then um, just philosophically, I, one of the key aspects to the WWE network um, has been that it allows you to have a direct to consumer relationship and access to real first party data. Uh, would keeping those be important in any strategic alternative? And uh, do these still matter to you or do you think that was um, a misplaced priority in the past? Well, I don't think it was misplaced. Uh, it was one of our goals. still continues to be. But when you're playing with some of the majors, it depends on whether or not we can negotiate, holding on to things of that nature. Sometimes, you know, the big boys want all of that for themselves. So it, it's a matter of, of really negotiation as to what we keep. But if we could keep it, absolutely. Right, but it, it's not a must-have for you. Not a what? Well, it, it, it's okay. not nothing. Nothing is a must-have. You know, uh, we will deal with uh, what's available, and again, it's going to fluctuate somewhat. You know, with what the majors want out of this. Okay, got it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eric Katz from Wolf Research. Thanks. Good morning. Um, one question on the 2020 guides of the 250 to 300. It's a it's a pretty big range when excluding, I guess, the increments from India and also the Middle East deal. What's driving that 50 million dollar range? Is that mostly on the network strategy? No, I would say that the reason for the range is is um, you know, the uncertainty around uh, what level of cost structure we can actually achieve through uh, cost reductions and other things, and, um, you know, where the rest of the business is going to perform. 
um, including the network in the interim in terms of the number of subscribers that we get. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we provided guidance that was, you know, realistic um, to what we thought we could achieve. And again, these numbers, let me just add, you know, just some color to that because I think these numbers are considerably conservative. Uh, and if uh, any one of these deals takes place, it's a... Uh, it's going to be a big deal. It's going to be transformative. Okay, understood. Um, and it sounds like, um, I guess just to be clear on some of the other comments and questions we've gotten so far, it, it sounds like there could be anything from a dual revenue stream where you still monetize the network just in a different way, or there's even a scenario where the network is completely shut down. Um, but I guess what we're all trying to figure out is it sounds like whatever you decide and the timing sounds like potentially before this event at the end of the quarter, the economics will be better than your current structure. I mean, is that generally a fair assessment? And is that from both a revenue and expense perspective? Uh, I think that we successfully achieved what we're trying to do uh, with the, the majors in, in terms of uh, their desire for our, our OTT. Again, as I said just a minute ago, it's transformative. I mean, this is our most okay. premium content, you know, that, that would be available. Okay, I guess maybe um, what would be helpful is, do you have a number on the profitability for the network currently? Is it, you know, in the 40, 50 million range? We, we don't provide that information. Okay. Um, I guess my last question would be, based on your comments for 2020 investments moderating, should we then assume the investments in Q4 are not a run rate for the entirety of 2020? I think we were talking about the level of increment uh, in, in 2020. Uh, obviously, we, as we said, we have investments in 2019 that are going to continue into 2020 because they were made during 20, 2019. So we're, I, okay. I would say that the run rate, the existing run rate, isn't going to go down in the first quarter, if that's what you're asking. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Eric Handler with MKM Partners. Good morning, and thanks for the question. I wonder if you could just give a little bit of color on the TV deals. You talk about $185 million incremental there in 2020 but if you take out the u.s step up which i believe is you know north of 200 million dollars you know maybe you can reconcile does that mean uk china latin america were all down and then is nxt in that number and the free-to-air money basically all that excludes is the component around our assumptions around uh nina and the increment around India. So everything else is uh, included in that. There's a small por portion uh, that we'd exclude that you know, is built into our forecast around contracts that renew but are, haven't been contracted yet. Um, but the vast majority is related to the other deals that you mentioned. And be but did, Sorry. did UK, China, and Latin America grow? Eric, we wouldn't get into specifics around terms of specific uh, terms and contracts with specific deals. Um. Okay, fair enough. And then a, a, a second question. With the WWE Network, late in 19, you did do a beta of uh, a free tier. Is that continuing now? Can you give us maybe some color on how it's performed in, in terms of maybe down, incremental downloads? Was the, the, the tier was launched in December, and I think it's too early to say exactly what the results are, of that have been. We're going to continue to analyze it, and when we have something, when we feel like we have good data around, you know, what, what effect it's having, we'll, we'll um, put that out there. And again, it was a soft launch. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Vasily Karasoyov with Cannonball Research. Thank you. Good morning. I wanted to ask a clarifying question on the guidance and specifically about the initiatives you mentioned um, in the Middle East and India. Um, so, first of all, 
<clears throat> has the decision been, been made to go ahead with those uh, with those uh, initiatives? And if not, what's the timeline? And then do I understand correctly from your uh, prepared remarks that if, if they were to go ahead, that would be an upside to the EBITDA for 2020. Do I understand that correctly, or would that require more of a spending period, which would uh, be a negative for the EBITDA for the year? Yes, we're still pursuing those new agreements, and you know, from our perspective, as quickly as we can get them done, that, that's what we're a aiming for. And I think, as I explained earlier, the the India rights are already we already have existing India rights, and they are in the guidance because we were already under, we are already um, doing you know being paid under that arrangement. It would be the increment on India, but yes, there's for Mina it would be a, a, an addition to the guidance. All right, thank you very much. Our next question is from Jason Bazinet with City. Uh, thanks. Um, so there's a lot of investors we're speaking with that um, are interested in your stock, um, but they're very nervous about what I'll call uh, X factors, you know, something, some sort of curveball. And so can I, I know this is a bit unorthodox, but can you just take a second and just maybe address some of the things that are out there in the marketplace just to put them to bed? So I'll give you two and feel free to add others. One is um, anything related to the XFL. That's what we hear. And, and then the second one is, is, is there anything in the, in the uh, Fox and Comcast agreement that's not a fixed payment? In other words, some sort of flexible payment that turns on the trajectory of the viewership. In other words, can investors sort of count on those dollars, whatever they are, or is there an embedded surprise, potentially? No, the contracts are, are what they are. That's not to say that we couldn't do more programming you know, with them and or others, we certainly could. Uh, and what was your uh, question on XFL? Well, there's just there, there's concern that in some way your personal investment in the XFL will somehow get swirled up into the sort of investment case for WWE, the public equity. No, there is none of that, basically. It's all, you know, again, I said we have uh, like 400 employees over there. Uh, it's, it's run by itself, uh, and there's no investment whatsoever, hardly than, you know, from yeah. WWE. So I think, you know, just if, there's no plan to put the XFL back into the, as a part of the WWE, if that's what you're asking. It's a completely yep. independent entity. Okay. Thank you. And Stephen Cahill from Wells Fargo has our next question. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could provide a little bit more color on some of the operating expenses that are driving the 2020 guide. You mentioned developing new sources of revenue, so I was wondering if you could give us a little more color on what those might be. And you also mentioned resetting the performance-based management incentive comp. Um, why does that increase costs in 2020 as well, maybe especially given that, that the stock's down quite a bit over the last 12 months? And I got a quick follow-up. Thank you. So the the cost areas you know increasing in uh, 2020 are around you know the production again we talked about the fact that we now do the SmackDown event four days later we're going to have the full year effect of that um, we have uh, higher higher costs um, related to some of the initiatives and I think we did say um, in the third quarter we talked about the increase in, in talent expense and that will roll over um, there are um, you know, considerations around um, new production, uh, developing new new content, um, and there are some costs um, in for that uh, as well. So what was your What was your second question? Uh, the second part of that uh, was then the you also resetting resetting of the MIP is quite, yeah. quite straightforward because of the the relative performance in 2019, the the payouts under the management incentive plan. Um, uh, were lower than uh, targeted, and when we build the plans for the for 2020, we, of course we put it in um, at, 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 a, at a rate where we would achieve that target. So um, that accounts for the increment. That's for the short term, the cash bonus plan. Um, the stock component uh, is not in adjusted OIVDA. So um, it, 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 you know clearly stock compensation might be lower if the stock stays lower, um, but it's not an adjusted OIVDA anyway. So it doesn't explain any of the difference. 
Okay. And then, uh, Vince, you just mentioned that India or MENA contracts could be transformative. I was wondering if you could tell us what you meant by that. Um, could those be more than just TV rights deals? Any more color there? Thank you. I believe Vince was referring to a net potential tra network transaction would be transformative. Okay. Thanks. And John Belton from Evercore has our next question. Thanks, Vince. I was hoping uh, you could give us some updated thoughts on AEW now that it's about a year into that promotion launching and you've been competing with them on Wednesday nights for about four months. Basically, they're trying to do fill a niche with more edgy content. Um, how do you feel about that strategy? What has it done for the category? How has AEW in general changed? your content and, and your business? Well, um, AEW has not changed our content uh, at all because it's all about uh, characters, and storylines, and resolutions. Uh, so it, it really hasn't changed our point of view in terms of what we present, and we don't need a, a more edgy, as, as you call it, a content, PG, one of the few uh, programs out there that really is PG. So uh, it's, as far as NXT, uh, you know, it's, we're competing. Uh, NXT is competing on Wednesday night with AEW and doing extremely well. Uh, and we're confident that NXT will continue on with a success. Got it. Thank you. And we have a question from Bernie McTurnan with Rosenblatt Securities. Great. Good morning. Thanks for taking the question. I was wondering, um, you know, based on the increased investment, what the return thresholds would be or, or how that's thought about and over what time frame. Is it all about being a, in a better position for the, the next rights renewal in the U.S., or um, could we see those returns prior? The, of course, we, we look at the return on investment for all the incremental investments, but they're largely tied to building the brand and building the content quality and engagement with fans to get the payoff in the, in the next content renewals. So that's, that's the objective. There's, it's a, um, always a healthy tension around how much do you invest for the, for the future payoff and what the landscape's going to look like at that time, and, uh, but th those are the judgments that are made. Got it. And then just to follow up on um, talent costs. So I believe the, the talent, um, what you pay the WWE superstars is based on percentage of revenue. Has that rate that you pay them gone up or is the impact just because of uh, revenue increasing as well? It's mostly revenue increasing. We've, we've always done uh, percentages with our talent. Generally speaking, you know, the more you know, revenue, the more money they make. Uh, and conversely, and so talent cost has gone up, um, and we're sort of proud of it. Got it, and thank you. And, and lastly, Vince, just wondering if you're, you know, with the management t turnover changing anywhere you're spending your time um, on a day-to-day -day -day basis, short-term, and, and the expected change you know, over the next few years? Um, at the moment, I'll have a few more reports, direct reports, uh, but going forward, um, that will not be the case in terms of allocating my time. Uh, I have a uh, pretty broad shoulders, and I can handle uh, a lot. Thank you. And we have a question from Alan Gould with Loop Capital. Uh, thank you. Seems to be a little bit of a divergence between some of the domestic trends and the international trends, uh, especially with respect to live events. I mean, domestic ratings have been improving, domestic average attendance was up, but uh, international average attendance has been uh, trailing domestic average attendance in terms of percent changes. Is it just a function of the locations you've been going, but it looks like, or is there something going on internationally? No, I think it's it, the, the difference in international is really mix and venue, um, what country, what venue, uh, and, and number of events, which is, is, is a little more variable in international because of the logistics associated with it. But that's the primary. There's nothing fundamentally different um, between the U.S. and international at this point. Thank you. And we have a question from John Healy with North Coast Research. 
Uh, thank you. Um, Vince, I want to ask a question about the, uh, the corporate leadership structure going forward. Um, rightfully so, the company has always had a very unique um, structure. Um, I, I was hoping you could give us a little bit of thought on terms of what ideally you would like the C-suites to kind of look like, um, you know, over the next couple of years. Um, and additionally, um, you know, how long it might take to maybe, um, you know, get to where you want to be with the, uh, with, with the transition of leadership. Well, I, I think that's for sure is, is, you know, in terms of changing or reimagining our culture and the way we do business, it, it's going to be far more inclusive. Uh, and quite frankly, with that, uh, in our strong management team currently, as well as going forward, you know, in attracting world-class uh, individuals to to our company who wouldn't want to work for WE. I mean, come on, it's 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 exciting. It's uh, we we err on the uh, 75 percentile in essence in terms of uh, what the value of an executive is, not on a 50-50 kind of. We we you get what you pay for. Um, so it and it do, it won't take us long either. You know to you know, to implement all that. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ray Stotchel with Consumer Edge Research. Great, thanks for taking my question. Could you be more specific about any explicit disagreements around strategy that you may have had with prior exec team members to give us a sense of uh, you know, how you're thinking about the business going forward uh, with some more granularity. It sounded like it was execution related, but just wanted to be clear there. A lot of it is execution related, and a lot of it is the, you know, focus as well, um, and as well as reallocation of resources. Again, looking at the way we do business, it's, it's going to be different and, uh, and more successful. Great, thanks. And then an another one on capital allocation. So aside from XFL, you, you do have a, a venture portfolio. How do we think about that when it comes to capital allocation? And what would be the potential for non-XFL related acquisitions over the next few years? Thanks. Yeah, we, well, I think we'll continue to make um, small equity investments, meaning not taking, taking a small equity stake in, in technologies and businesses that uh, where there are enhancements to or learning that can be put into the WWE organization, I don't think that those are going to be, um, you know, material and, and and you know because of the size of the, the si in the sense of the size of those investments. So, uh, but I do think it's a valid uh, uh, strategy and has has created uh, some opportunities for the business. So I think we will continue that on, on, at a modest level. I think you just mentioned XFL again. You know, there's a totally separate entity. Great. Thanks again. And we have a question from Brandon Ross with White Shed Partners. Hi. Um, just a couple of um, uh, clarifying questions. Um, were were any WWE network profits excluded from the guidance, or do you assume that the network continues as is for the purpose of the guide? We didn't assume that any of the strategic options that we're looking at with respect to the network would be achieved in in, in the impact of guidance. Right, but obviously, uh, obviously so, an ongoing business in the network and and our. So it plan. would be a, you're assuming it's a contributor. Correct. But nothing okay. new, and not not in the sense of any new strategic deal or any uh, you know major change in the way we're doing business in the network or who we're partnering with. That would not be included. But we have an ongoing business, um, you know, and that business will continue until we you know make a change in how it's operated. Okay. And, it is, and, and then when we build our plans, and when we build our plans, and we give our guidance, it's included. Okay, got it. And then, can, can you explain a little more um, specifically who is going to fill George and Michelle's roles um, within within the company? Are 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 you bringing in additional senior executives? I think that's what you said. Um, or the business unit leader is going to take on additional responsibilities. How are you going to fill those roles? Uh, we're, we're in search now uh, with an exceptional uh, a talent to come in. Uh, at the same time, we have huge faith in, uh, in our current um, our, 
current role in terms of our management team. Okay, got it. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, as a final reminder, that is star and then one if you would like to ask a question at this time. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you listening to the call today. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's conference. We appreciate your participation today. You may now disconnect.